from their encounters with races from other planets. The information is the activation. Let's awaken this world together. We are the forever students, and we will not be silent. We are the ones that we've been waiting for. Pretty well. Welcome, everybody, to Full Spectrum Universe. My name is Rob Yox. We are the embattled broadcast from the great state of New York. We are the ones that explore the past, to remain in the present, and to dictate the terms of our future. What an incredible episode we have for you tonight. Good friend Paul Wallace is here. We're going to be talking about the Eden Conspiracy, the new book that is coming out, set to launch, I believe, within the next couple of hours. We are so excited. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Paul, Paul has been on this channel and a part of our events for a very, very long time. He is the, the co-creator of The Fifth Kind, which is huge. His books, the Eden series, are Amazon bestsellers. I mean, he tops the charts. His, his author ability is just transcending of this time. So without further ado, because I want to give the entire hour to this conversation of back and forth, he's one of my personal mentors. I look to his work, and it is directed in my work how he has affected me. So without further ado, Paul Wallace. G'day. Hello, sir. G'day, Rob. Thanks for having me on once again. It's a red letter day. It is the launch day of the Eden Conspiracy. And you are my launch show, Rob. Oh, man, that, that's incredible. I love I love being here at, 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 right at the precipice of just the rest of the uh, future taking place. And we're here in this moment. And I couldn't be more appreciative to to be here with you, because like we were just talking about off screen, how this book it, it, it's it's a nice bow to all of the things that we have been working on, and it's all wrapped together. There's so many intricacies that you talk about just from the be, just from the beginning of the book, and how you've seen so many different things happening in person, but also the accounts of others. How that how it's all culminated to these moments and bringing the Eden series together. And I think that this installment of the Eden series, I'm not sure if you're going to have another one or not, but if this is the final one, it is the coup de gras for sure of just it's in its epicness, right? So I just want to say that we appreciate you here. We love you. And your work to me is bar none. When they say that you are the new Eric Von Daniken and the Chariots of the Gods, I wholeheartedly agree. And I think that everybody out there does as well. Oh, thank you, Rob. I'm really excited about the Eden Conspiracy. I think it stands alone as a book that people can come to who are completely fresh to the subject. And they will follow the logic. The story will carry them through. But for people who've read Escaping from Eden, The Scars of Eden, Echoes of Eden, it's going to go a degree deeper into looking at what were the stories of the Bible before they became stories about God. And the implications, I show the implications perhaps on a grander scale than in previous books and in a way that I think very relevant to today as people look around saying what is going on who runs the world how do they do that where does that authority come from and in this book i dig deeper and ask what was it our ancestors wanted us to know before the biblical narratives got hijacked and changed into a religion of worship and compliance i you know I, I so we were just talking about this too, but it's so fitting for right now. There is this this precedent that's being set by the controlling few trying to essentially capitulate the masses to their whim and will. And your th this specific uh, this specific book talks in the very, very from the jump. It talks about how they've done so much to squash out certain factors of what we knew to be the ancestral narratives and they replaced it with something that sort of stamps down human ability and potential. Absolutely. I mean, all governments want full spectrum dominance. They want a population that is easy to manage. And in my previous book, Echoes of Eden, I show how the suppression of indigenous stories is part and parcel of a policy to make populations more governable. But in the Eden Conspiracy, I sort of show in real time what that suppression looks like. I had an experience way back in the 80s when I was in Brazil that allowed me to see 
that kind of suppression in real time at the hands of the authorities of the Roman Catholic Church, which was under the reign of John Paul II at that time. And uh, I think where you are in the book, Rob, you've seen that what's happening there is exactly the same as what was happening in the 8th to 7th century BCE in ancient Israel. And I show that the narrative that's being suppressed is the same, the means of suppression are the same, and it's part of a much bigger picture than ever I was aware of when as a young theological student, I was in Brazil there to study uh, the churches and new movements within the church. But it took me decades to understand what I'd really seen and to understand that what I was seeing was a suppression of indigenous knowledge of paleo contact. And I unpack all that in the opening chapters of the Eden Conspiracy. It, it, you know, and that's it. Oh, I, I just love hearing you say that because it's so true. Even even what you under, even what the you know, when you're there in that moment, you did probably didn't realize it until you looked back, you know, and you said it took decades to figure out exactly what was happening. And how did that moment sort of change for you? Just like emotionally and sort of like the light bulb moment that gave you the instinct of being like, well, wait a minute. Now I see it from a different perspective. Where was like that connection? If you understand what I mean, like from being back then, there's a certain emotional structure you had while going through it. But where was the moment where you're like, well, there's something more to that now? Like what get, kind of like give us the details of how it led up to that? It really was very, very gradual. I mean, at the time, I was seeing amazing grassroots movements in the interior of Brazil, in Amazonia. And I could see that the Roman Catholic authorities were trying to shut down this grassroots political power because they had you know, made accords with the powers that were in Brazil of the 1980s. They didn't want destabilizing factors. But as a young evangelical believer, I thought, what they're doing is they're quashing what I would call revival. They're quashing what I would consider very positive grassroots empowerment. So my initial framework was, yeah, the Protestants are right and the Catholics are wrong. And I, I viewed it in that tiny religious mindset. And then I started realizing, no, it's not about that because the catalysts of these exciting movements, they're Roman Catholics too. So it's actually one model of church against another model of church. It's stakeholders versus pioneers. And then I just kept stay, taking steps back and seeing a bigger and bigger picture and realizing that it was a lot more to do with politics than it was to do with theology. But I don't think I really made the connection between what I was being told about paleo contact um, I don't think I joined those dots until maybe five years ago in my research path for Escaping from Eden, which was the first book in the Eden series. And I suddenly realized that the picture that was emerging as I drilled into the Bible and into the root meanings of keywords was a familiar picture. Why was it familiar? When I started hearing the Mayan stories, from the Popol Vuh and the Mayan tradition of Hun Hunapu, when I started hearing the Zulu tradition concerning Mbabwana Warisa enabling humanity's great leap forward. As I listened to other great leap forward stories from all around the world, I was thinking, I have heard this before, and bit by bit realized, oh my goodness, that is what my Brazilian friends were explaining to me back in the 80s. They were explaining their cultural memory from their African roots and from their indigenous Brazilian roots, their memory was of paleo contact. They had festivals to celebrate the great leap forward from maybe 10,000 years ago, maybe 60,000 years ago, when ET visitors came and nurtured our ancestors in agricultural science and all the rudiments of civilization. That's what my guide, Augusto, was talking about. And I had to go back and reframe my understanding of all the conversations I had had all the way back as they tried to explain what you're seeing is not Roman Catholicism, it's something completely different. And now I have a word for it, and it's paleo contact. 
you know, it's incredible too how those oral traditions are so st still so prominent, and the indigenous tradition and it just shines through that the fact that they could even do that from you know there's a, a, a basically a staple of of what would be Roman Catholicism there, and the peoples in the town around were just sort of you know doing what they felt was right in that moment, and this is something. Well, they that, were they were maintaining their family traditions. Yes. So when John Paul II comes along and says we are going to get rid of all the non-Catholic elements of these ceremonies and festivals. It was a full frontal attack on their indigenous heritage and their African heritage. John Paul was saying, I only want the Portuguese contribution here and everything else can be gotten rid of. So it was an attack on their family identity, their family history. And that was how they viewed it. And it took me a while to understand what. Um, cultural genocide means. There are obvious forms of it when you see the slaughter of millions of Cathars in, in the 1200s. Uh, there are more obvious forms of it when you look at the stolen generation policies and the, um, the boarding school tragedy that you find in Canada, in North America, uh, in Australia. And there's an attempt to get rid of an ethnic tradition and a cultural tradition. But here was something very similar going on. No violence other than this cultural violence to say your African heritage, irrelevant, your indigenous narrative, irrelevant, Portuguese Catholicism only. And it is a suppression not only of you know, devotional practices, this isn't a story about religious purity. This is a story about information. Information those cultures had carried about human origins and our place in the cosmos. And it was information that was unwelcome to religious authorities wanting to control the narrative and manage the population and maintain the status quo of agreements they had with the political powers that were. That's, it's incredible that the, the fact that you point that out, too, because there's so many, you know, smatterings of information across all of these ancient indigenous cultures, and they all sort of link together as well, which is incredible. We see a lot of the repetitive nature, which brings us back to comparative mythology, which you and I know I love comparative mythology. I know you do, too. And we see this. And, you know, when we talk about things like like the. Um, the specific names that they have and how they transcended to different cultures. And, you know, I, I think it's really, really wild. I kind of want to shift gears a little bit because I wanted to talk a little bit about the, you know, the specifics of how you argue that the Hebrew scripture, right. And what the Christians call the old Testament was originally not for worshiping or obeying God. It was about ET e contact with the ancestors. So I, I kind of want to talk through that a little bit and get to how you came to this. And of course, I, I know, a lot of what you've written already, but for those of people, for the people who are sort of coming to who you are now, which is if you've been living under a rock, I mean, you've been all over the place, coast to coast and amongst many, many shows, but kind of go through that and how it, this book cycles through that as well. Sure. Well, I reach my conclusions about paleo contact from my background in church ministry. So 33 years, I was in church based ministry, working as a church doctor an archdeacon in the Anglican Church in Australia, and a theological educator training pastors in hermeneutics. And hermeneutics is the principles of interpretation. How do we interpret ancient texts to be sure that we're getting out of them what we're supposed to, what the authors intended, and not something that we've read in? And it's really the tools of hermeneutics that have led me into the world of paleo contact. So in particular, what do the words mean? And so throughout the Eden Conspiracy, I drill down into the root meanings of key words. Now, there are many words the Bible has used which have been translated as God. Elohim, El Elyon, El Shaddai, Yahweh. And I argue in the Eden Conspiracy that none of these words should have been translated as God. They all mean something quite different. So I drill down into those meanings. There are other key words as well. Uh, Haia. What does that mean when Ezekiel talks about the being that piloted him around 
back in the day. What is a Kali Mapasau? What is a Kali Mashatau? Because it seems to behave like advanced technology. What is a Ruach? Something else that appears to behave like advanced technology. What is a Kavod? What does Olam mean if it doesn't mean eternal? So these are some of the key words I drill down into. And you don't have to go too far into the origins of these words to realize there's a whole other story hidden in plain sight in the text. And it is the story of the Tseva Hashemayim. Now, if you read, say, the King James Bible, you'll find that Tseva Hashemayim is translated as the heavenly host. And if I say those words, you're probably thinking the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. All these beautiful naked bodies rippling with muscle and a little bit of flab here and there with sheets draped across them and they're in a blue sky looking awesome. Is that what the heavenly host looks like? What is a host? What does heavenly mean? Go to the root meanings. It means sky armies. The Bible is the story of our ancestors' intersection with the sky armies. It's there in the words, but it's also there in the archaeology of the deep past and the archaeology of Judaism. That's referenced in the story of the Bible itself. So, for instance, we have King Hezekiah and King Josiah who order the Jerusalem guard to go in and destroy all the carvings of the sky armies that are there in the Jerusalem temple. They want to obliterate the physical memory of what Yahweh looked like. They want to obliterate the memory of Asherah and Dagon and Baal and all these interesting entities, El of Ekron, El of the Philistines, all portrayed. And not only were they portrayed in carvings, there were whole temples dedicated to these advanced beings remembered by the tribes of Israel from the deep past. That remembering had to be ended. And the Bible tells the story of the destruction of the ancient sites, the destruction of the other priesthoods, uh, the priesthood of Asherah, the temples of Asherah, the standing stones erected by their ancestors. Bearing in mind, we're talking about people like Jacob, right at the beginning of the story of the tribes of Israel, who had erected standing stones to commemorate his encounter with advanced beings coming and going from space. And then those standing stones become an altar, become a temple. You have kings like Solomon, I mean, the wisest of all kings, who constructed a whole temple to Asherah and commissioned a priesthood to Asherah. So all these things are gotten rid of, and the Bible actually reports the story of this paring down of Judaism from a canon of stories about paleocontact to a religion of worship and obedience. It names the people who made those changes. It names a king, King Josiah. It names a high priest, Hilkiah. It names a royal scribe, Shaphan. It names the successor of the high priest, Ezra, who enforced the change of Judaism into Yahwist religion. And as all that picture is unpacked in the Eden Conspiracy, I show how it was that the high priestly family took control of the narrative, decided to get rid of all the competing priesthoods. So there was now only the high priesthood of Yahweh to demolish all the other temples. So there was now only the temple of Yahweh and to begin redefining what the tribes of Israel believed about God, about themselves, about the world in which we live. And I mapped that whole process out. So a part of it is looking at the history of words in the Bible, but I also go to archeological sites in modern times and find artifacts that demonstrate what the Bible was before it was a book of religion. It's it's incredible too. And this is kind of a question that's sort of outside of the box of of everything, but with this whitewashing or this this moment to squash specific sort of uh religious beliefs, who do you think is responsible for that? Do you think it was man or the 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 uh 
the greedy elite or is there some sort of darker force behind the whole thing sort of giving these men the uh the blueprint to sort of take out this the uh indigenous thought process and their narratives well the bible itself actually traces a progression from a time when our ancestors were governed by powerful advanced beings who are not human to a time when all the visible position holders are human. And so it maps out that shift. And we're now at this end of that shift. When we look around and ask who runs the world, we look at human beings. We look at the families that own the major corporations. We look at royal families. We look at politicians. But the story of the Bible says that actually there are other powers who are still involved at a covert government level. Now, that's the claim of the Bible as we follow the Yahweh storyline through the book. And it's also the claim in modern times of people like Ed Mitchell, the sixth man to walk on the moon, and in 2020, just before Christmas, Haim Ashed, the brigadier general who for 27 years was Israel's chief of space security. So it was his job to know about contact. And according to all the knowledge he accrued in that position, he stepped forward and said, we have been in contact at a covert government level for a long, long time. And so the Bible talks about that move from over governance by non-humans to covert government, where there are now hidden hands in the world of geopolitics. So that's a part of the answer. If you ask your question again, Rob, I'll remember the other half of my answer. It would basically, you know, if it was just a sense of if if this was man's doing oh, or is there a direction of some sort doing? of higher entity from yeah. it? As I said before, the Bible actually names people responsible for making this shift that would suppress the remembrance of paleo contact. And there was a big change that happened when Josiah became king. Now, Josiah became king and oversighted the renovations of the Jerusalem temple. And at some point during the renovations, a book was found called the Book of the Laws of Yahweh. And Josiah decided that is going to be the religion of our people, because at that time, the Bible's very clear, they honored a whole plethora of beings from their past. They honored all kinds of advanced beings they'd remembered from their history and prehistory. Josiah says, no longer are we going to do that. We'll get rid of all the installations commemorating those other beings. We're going to worship Yahweh and follow these laws. And this book will be the uh, imprimatur of my royal power. It will explain why I am king and why everyone must do what I say. Now, he was only eight years old when this book was found. So we need to picture exactly how this shift happened. If you have a ceremonial king who's only eight years old, that's no problem. Some might say that's cute. But if you've got a king with real power and he's only eight years old, you've got a crisis, an opportunity for some, an emergency for others. And there's a parallel for what happened in British history. There was a moment where after a very powerful dictatorial king came a nine-year-old boy. I'm talking about Edward VI. And as soon as he acceded to the throne, two families jumped up and seized the opportunity to take control of royal policy. They were two families, the Dudleys and the Seymours, who were very invested in the religious reforms of the previous generation of Henry VIII. And in order to push those reforms forward, they took care care of Edward VI to push these reforms further. And so you can imagine you've got, you know, Uncle Dudley and Uncle Seymour saying, Edward, I've identified another serious threat to your authority over the kingdom. Would you like me to take care of it? Oh, thank you, Uncle. Well, exactly the same thing, of course, happened to Josiah. Josiah was a Yahwist. Hilkiah, the high priest, was a Yahwist. Sire, I've identified serious threats to your power over your kingdom. 
it's all these other random priesthoods who don't owe you any fealty and they don't worship our God. Would you like me to deal with it? So every yes to that kind of conversation meant the dismantling of another priesthood, the destruction of another temple, and the narrowing down of the conversation until we've got a neat and tidy theocracy with just one God at the top called Yahweh and one king and one high priestly family and one temple, one place to which all the tithes are now going to be directed, a massive centralization of power. And by turning Judaism into a religion, in effect, the high priestly family had repositioned themselves for what was to come, which was the end of the monarchy. Because 23 years after the death of Josiah, there was no more Jewish monarchy. There was only one authority in Judaism, and it was the authority of the high priestly family and the religion that they oversighted, which was a monotheistic, Yahwist religion. And in a way, it was very strategic because it enabled Judaism to survive the annexation, the exile, uh, the conquest by Babylonian forces. And if instead the power had remained with the monarchy, Judaism wouldn't have ended up as monotheism because the last three Jewish kings were not Yahwists. They were paleo contact people. And so I unpack all that story and then show how a generation later, when the Persian king Cyrus uh, is now running that region and says, actually, I want the tribes of Israel to have freedom of religion. I want them to be happy. They'll be easier to manage that way. And he authorizes a descendant of Hilkiah the high priest to enforce the correct religion over the repaired Jerusalem temple. And it was Yahwism, Yahwist monotheism. And so the change took about 200 years to happen. But the change took us from a place where Judaism was actually uh, ethnically based and contained all the memories of paleo contact of that people group. And their memories can still be found in the Bible. And they are some of the finest, most finessed explanations of paleo contact that we have in our written record transformed it from that into a religion of monotheism, worship, and obedience. And so you can see how it happened, who did it, why it happened, and what the consequences have been from that day to this, because Josiah could have picked any number of beings to be the focus of worship in his theocracy. He could have said, let's have Asherah, because she enabled our great leap forward. She nurtured our people. That will be the one we worship. But instead, he picked Yahweh, the ruthless, violent conqueror. And in picking that figure, he ennobled and empowered himself and any other Yahweh's king in the future to use violence and force to maintain power and indeed conquer other people's countries. So the implications of that choice couldn't have been further reaching. It's incredible, too, because when people in now, like in the present, when they look at the Bible, they look back at the Old Testament and they say, wow, this 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 figure is that's that's the God that they're worshiping is essentially a lot more vitriolic and, and really based in, in, in almost a fear based style campaign to get the people to, you know, adhere to its will. And then you get to the New Testament and it's like completely different. It's like, you know, the God is a little bit more loving and, you know, he's accepting of everything. So it's it's really wild, too. And one of the things that, that happens in the beginning of the book, The Eden Conspiracy, which the link is below. If you haven't gotten your copy yet, there's the Amazon link is below for you to get it. Or you can go to I'm sure you can go to Paul's website, which is the top link down below. Um, what happens is that there's this this move, this move away from this balance of the masculine and the feminine. And how the femininity or the feminine aspects is what gives civilization or nurtures the beginnings of civilization and what it means to be a civilized people. So go into that a little bit and describe a little bit more of how you saw it in the very, very beginning as we look at some of these these texts. Well, in the Eden Conspiracy, I go to a place called Tel El Farah, which has been an archaeological site 
since the 1940s. It's in ancient Samaria, S.A. Samaria. And there we have a picture of what Jewish practice looked like in the 8th century BCE. And there and at another site in Tel Arad, you can find figurines of a, an emphatically female figure where the vulva is emphasized, big breasts, big bouffant hair. This is the figure who's being commemorated. And then there are reliefs showing women baking um, cornbread. And this was how they commemorated Asherah. We also find at Tel El Farah a naus, which represents, well, if I tell you what a naus is, it's a doorway to nowhere. It's a doorway with no building around it, and there's nothing behind it. And yet through that doorway, advanced beings can step into our world. Now, I reckon we have a word for that. I would call that a portal. And over, over the top of this particular portal that was found in Tel El Farah, is a uh, there are a couple of symbols there's a crescent moon and a bunch of stars now a crescent moon and a bunch of stars could mean a couple of things and if you ask many archaeologists they'll say well what this means is the naus the doorway represents a building the building isn't depicted it's considered implied and the moon and the stars represent a time of year so it's saying near here is a temple to Asherah because the inverted palm trees represent her. And this is the time of year when we do the harvest festivals. Well, that, that's a perfectly good explanation. But the language of symbology is many layered. And just as a for instance, uh, when I was first in ministry decades ago in London, I worked at a very high church Anglo Catholic parish. If you walked into one of our services, you would think you were in a Roman Catholic parish. We did we did all the ceremonial. And you would find things like the reserved sacrament and robes and processions and incense and candle-bearing boys. And all those things had a Christian meaning. But as somebody from uh, Second Temple uh, Judaism had stepped into our meeting that have said, oh, I see you do the showbread like we do. They would invest what we were doing with a Jewish meaning. They would see the skull cap that the bishop was wearing and invest that with a Jewish meaning. Someone from ancient Rome would look at how we do our processions and say, oh, I can see all the statements you're making here about power and compliance. And looking at the robes you're wearing, I recognize some Roman imperial colors here. If somebody from Second Temple Judaism looked at what I was wearing, they'd say, oh, I can see you're one of our priests. You're wearing exactly the same garb and you've got exactly the same kind of thurible burning the incense. If the bishop turned up in his purple, someone from ancient Persia would say, ah, I can see he's in charge because he's wearing the royal purple that King Cyrus of Persia chose. Um, there are other aspects, too, that would put a Babylonian interpretation on things as soon as the bishop puts on his fish-shaped hat. So you've got layers of meaning in what we were doing. Christian, Jewish, Roman, Babylonian, Persian. And what we were doing had roots in all those cultures. So if I come back to that naus at Tel El Farah and ask what does the crescent moon and that cluster of stars mean according to the source culture? According to the culture of ancient Sumeria, a different interpretation emerges, an interpretation that says that's a star map. And that crescent moon represents a constellation, Taurus. And those stars, they're not random stars. They're the stars of the Pleiades. And so this now suddenly says this is a place where Asherah appeared through a doorway from the constellation Taurus from a planet orbiting the stars of the Pleiades. Now, some might listen to, say, listen to that and say, that's a bit of a stretch, isn't it? Until you realize that there are cultures all around the world. 
listen to Aboriginal Australians, listen to Native American traditions, they will tell you that our ancient tutors who came in the deep past to sit with our ancestors, give us all the rudiments of agricultural science, all the principles of agronomy, medicine, sanitation, all the rudiments of city building, civilization building, they say our helpers came from the Pleiades. And so did the 8th century BCE Jews who lived at Tel El Farah. Same story. So that's what's going on. And the cult of Asherah was so pervasive that probably those figurines of Asherah are among the most prolific items found in archaeological digs throughout the Levant and beyond, because it goes well beyond that part of the world. You can go to Egypt and you'll find the equivalent of Asherah there. You'll find Hathor, you'll find Venus, you'll find Astarte, you'll find Aphrodite, you'll find the Lion Lady. All these are versions of Asherah, the female who enabled us to make our great leap forward. So the female aspect of paleocontact, very, very important. And you can find carvings where you've got Asherah and Yahweh alongside each other. And it's like they are the two poles of our experience of ET contact in the deep past. On the one hand, helpful, positive, nurturing, empowering. And on the other side, brutal, colonizing, exploitative. Put the two together, you've got the full picture. Take Asherah away, and all that you're left with is control and dominance. Turn Yahweh into God. And that's your vision of God. If you've got a God who is a violent colonizer, guess what you are going to become? Guess what you will justify in his name? And indeed, that is exactly what has happened throughout the centuries. That was masterfully told just now. You went into so many different directions, but that's exactly right, too. And this 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 version of the Seven Sisters of the Pleiades is so prominent in, in almost every culture, so much so that I was even doing a presentation trying to get all of it together and look at the, the actual links of how that story is told and really go deep on it because there is an, there is an amazing amount of information that can be told about how all, all of these cultures shared a lot of what you know they held dear in their ceremony and ah. their initiation. Yes, and what they held dear in their culture, because all the things for which Asherah stood, uh, natural, organic, rotational, combination farming, the nurture of human beings, the nurture of society, the facilitation of grassroots power, these are often regarded as weak or irrelevant when we come to the real world of politics. We don't want politicians who are like that, all lovely and gentle and nurturing. We worship power. We vote for the powerful person. And that explains the outcome of a lot of general elections, if you stop and think about it. And it also dismisses the value of the female contribution to society. If females are teaching those things, as they do in many indigenous cultures, well, that's what we move on from and grow out of. If they provide the glue of society, that's great, but I want to grow a corporation. And I think the way we put down the female contribution to society and elevate the male is a direct psychological consequence of dethroning Asherah and the apotheosis of Yahweh and turning Yahweh into God. It's a straight line from the one to the other. That's incredible. You said that. That was you're like reading my mind. And I'm thinking to myself, is Asherah one of the seven sisters or is she the mother of the seven sisters? Is she the one that gives birth to all the representations of what the seven sisters meant? As in, you know, but go ahead. Well, I'll let you answer that. Asherah, <clears throat> a.k.a. Astarte, a.k.a. Hathor, the Lion Lady, is often uh, referenced as the mother of the gods. So you could see her that way. But at another level, Asherah is the personification of a population that came from the Pleiades to help human colonies all around the planet. And I think that there really was that multiplicity of beings and that multiplicity of inputs that was made that enabled the Great Leap Forward to pepper up all around the planet very, very quickly. 
And the speed at which that happened has long fascinated archaeologists and anthropologists. So uh, I personally believed, yes, there were beings, flesh and blood beings, who appeared female to our ancestors, who did this tuition in agronomy. And then as the stories have got told and retold, Asherah becomes the embodiment of something bigger and bigger until she's the mother of the gods. But I think that's just a way of personifying the female nurturing side of the story. That's it's incredible. I, I mean, to talk about these these connections too is just it blows my mind when you said that too. It's like wow, she that is correct. I, I feel like I might even borrow that for the presentation because I think it's so right on that it's the embodiment of these flesh and blood beings, and they were everywhere. And I think that maybe these beings separated while on this planet went to these indigenous peoples one by one or two at a time, three at a time, and all referenced back to where they were from and how many of them actually landed or something like that. You know what I mean? It's sort of like a, a, a layer lift on that too. So there's so much, so much information based on that. And I love that you've, you know, you talk about that in the very beginnings of the book too, and how this ability to, to stamp down. And I keep saying stamp down because that's what they did. They, they pushed it down at a gradual pace until it was no more year by year. They would take a little bit more, a little bit more away from this, this balance of the masculine and the feminine saying that the masculine was what was prominent and what it would be. And it did directly lead to the, that, that rise of Yahweh in this, this violent nature of man, which we embody so much right now. And I think now the question to piggyback off that is you think now we're coming back into that balance, understanding and learning these topics. Now, do you believe that it's going to give us back this balance of the masculine and the feminine or to raise that femininity aspect up to a more prominent position amongst, especially, you know, culture itself? Yes, we have been seeing a correction. So over the last couple of generations, we have had a shift in gender, gender politics. And I think uh, if I can just thumbnail it as the women's movement has been very, very important to our health as a species. And it's a many layered story. There's been a fight for equality in the workplace, which is absolutely right and fair. But then within that, we've realized that the workplace and workplace politics has to change. It's not good enough just to import females into a male environment and say, well, these are the rules. The environment has to change. And having seen some adaptation in uh, corporate culture, we now realize there has to be some adjustment in political culture as well, because so many of our structures are, are built on sort of force and authority and models of leadership that are really rooted in, in what we see modeled in the Bible by, by the male figures, by people like Yahweh. There is an adjustment going on. And what I find interesting is that having begun to tackle these issues at a human level, we now look with very different eyes on ancient traditions, and we begin to recognize the importance of the female aspects of those traditions and begin to feel very uncomfortable with the suppression of female traditions in our own cultures and in our own scriptures. So now when we go back and read the story of the Bible and realize that the narrators want the female story stamped out, you begin to feel less at home with the narrator. And the narrators don't hide the fact that um, the Jewish people in the 8th century BCE loved Asherah. We are told openly in 2 Kings in the book of Jeremiah that the people of Israel uh, disrespected Yahweh and disregarded his laws, and they spoke slightingly of him, and they remembered Asherah with affection. The narrators tell us this, expecting us to go, how atrocious, isn't that appalling? But the moment you separate the narrator's evaluation of what's going on with his description of what's going on, you realize he's just told us that Judaism used to be something very, very different. And then when we go from there to the orders given by King Hezekiah and Hilkiah the high priest 
to obliterate the memory of Asherah and knock down all the installations and break the altars and disband the priesthood. Now we feel very uncomfortable with it, and rightly so, because we have made some social progress in the last couple of generations. So it's kind of funny that it's been that way around. If we'd been reading the Bible attentively, it could have happened the other way around. It could have happened that we read the ancient texts and said, yes, we see misogyny here, and we need to return to our earlier appreciation to the kaleidoscope of help that the cosmos has offered us, and we need to change how we live in the light of it. But historically, it's actually happened the other way around, and we're beginning to recover what is in ancestral wisdom to redress the balance, not only of how we live, but our whole worldview about humanity. I, I think that you're so right on, too. And, and I had the same exact thought in the beginning when I was starting to read about Judaism and the way it was beginning. It's like, wait a minute, I never actually heard any of this side just like this and, and the way that it was being told. And I'm like, this changes a lot of things. This changes a lot of what we know because uh, going into those into that ancient in, into that ancient box of you know what what they were before these great changes or these 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 leaps i guess is is kind of how we look at it and and predominantly right after that first generation after those leaps and how things change so wildly from from one you know one period of time to the next it's it's incredible so one of the things I wanted to ask, too, is uh, what was the, the Seba ha Hasamayim was one of the ones I wanted to ask about, too, and we go into the, the memory loss of that. The Seba Hashemayim represents the kaleidoscope of beings who visited us in the past, and it's the Bible's word for sky armies. Now, if you read the Sumerian stories, you've got stories of sky armies conflicts among the ET visitors who colonized our planet and then bumped up against one another in uneasy competition. Similar stories, of course, in the Greek panoply, in the Vedic stories, in the Norse stories. So Tseva Hashemayim is the Jewish word for that, and it means sky armies. And so among them, you've got beings who are named, beings like El Elyon, beings like El Shaddai, Yahweh, El of Ekron, El of the Philistines, uh, El of Persia, you've got Dagon, Baal. Those are all named, but the Tseva Hashemayim is the catch-all to describe all those beings, all those demographic, demographics, whether they were from the Pleiades, Orion, Sirius, they were all the Tseva Hashemayim. That's it's wild too how they they they're all looked at in some sort of elevated status as well, correct? When they when these off world entities come down, they're seen, of course, because not just of their technology, but that it looks like their stature is almost larger than life when they're talked about in in all of the ancient texts, not just Judaism or Christianity. You know, while while we're looking at this, when we see a lot of this change in society once that contact is made and how well, they could be potentially responsible for humanity as well, too. You know, and what we're looking at now, a lot of people in the in the um, in the audience are asking about the Anunnaki and how the Anunnaki fall into the beginnings of of, of that sort of you know Zach and Zachariah Sitchin's work too. But how that kind of goes into that terminology and really, how, did the ancient Sumerians set a precedent? Do you believe for the rest of the world was that the beginning of the cradle of life on this earth, as far as you see it? The ancient Sumerian culture is the uh, earliest civilization that we know about officially. And it seemed to appear from nowhere with all the machinery of modern civilization in the sense that they had money, legal systems, writing, literature, sanitation, mathematics, cosmology, they had a banking system. And uh, it just seemed to pop up from nowhere. Where did they come from? Well, their stories gave an explanation, but their stories are from millennia previously. They're describing something that happened in the deep past. But if we go to the daughter culture of Babylon, we have the story of Oannes and the Apkalu. 
which is the Babylonian explanation for where that great leap forward came from. And it talks about uh, this being, Oannes, and the Apkalu, who arrived from somewhere, we're not quite sure where, and we're told the reaction of our ancestors when they saw these beings arriving. Were they human? Were they aquatic? What was the clothing they were wearing? Why were they wearing clothes that covered the whole of their bodies? They'd never seen that before. And what was that fabric? Because it was so thin and shiny. It was like the skin of a fish. And it's almost like you're hearing their thoughts in real time as they have this encounter. I find that very compelling because they don't say these advanced beings came and we were immediately in awe of their wisdom. It was they looked so strange and they wore such odd things. That, to me, is a very realistic reaction. But here's the question. Who were they? Where did they come from? Were they genuinely semi-aquatic? Or was that an assumption because of how they looked and the fact that they had arrived from an underwater base? Are they earthlings who live in underwater bases? Or were they from somewhere else? Well, there's a little clue that could be found in West Africa, in Mali. When we listen to the elders, the Dogon people, who describe identical beings and credit them in an identical way as being the source of our knowledge as a civilization. And they said, no, they're not from here originally, though they may have been on Earth for a very long time. They come from Sirius C. And they told anthropologists this back in the 1930s before you or I were around uh, before our predecessors even heard of a serious sea. So you put those two traditions together and you realize the Babylonians are saying it was people from Sirius who enabled the Great Leap Forward. The Sumerian story, I don't believe, identifies where other than they came from the heavens. Anunnaki, I agree with Sitchin, means those who came to earth from the heavens. It's a word that would mean visitors astronauts, space people, star people. In my books, I refer to them as sky people. And the Anunnaki, the sky people of the Sumerian stories, appear all through the Bible, only the Bible has renamed them Elohim, a word which means powerful ones. Incredible, incredible. Now, this question is for you, and it's not so, it is about the book, but it's more about your perception. Now that you've gotten this information to paper and you're putting this book out, how does that feel to to give this to the people now that you've been sort of working in this line of thought? And this is the the, you know, the, the latest installment, of course. But how does it feel now to tell the story out for everybody to see? Just I know we did it with all the rest of them. But is there like an emotional release for you when you feel, when you get to put it to paper and then have it published? It's a huge sense of relief. Uh, firstly, because you carry all this information in your mind and in your body and you're trying to process it and get your head around it and get it coherent. And then once it's on paper and once it's coherent on paper, it's a huge sigh of relief. It's now it's now got its own life. It's got its objective external reality. And the book takes on a life of its own as soon as you publish it. It's a huge sense of relief to get through the mechanics of getting it published and out there. I'm feeling that even as I'm talking to you today, Rob, I'm excited as the clock ticks around the planet, as uh, the sun rises around different parts of the planet, that the book is becoming available and the book has a life of its own. I consider it really important information, so I'm excited to get the information out there. I'm excited by the Eden Conspiracy because I think it can reach an even bigger audience than the first three. I think it makes the case for paleo contact even more powerfully than the first three, and it shows the implications on uh, a grander scale and in a way that's very topical to the present day. I think people who've followed the Eden series will be excited when they've read the Eden Conspiracy because they'll think, I can give this to anybody I know, someone who gives this zero credibility, has zero interest in it, but there's enough here to carry them through the book and that will hopefully make 
them look better as the friend who talks about paleo contact because here's the mathematics, here's the proof, here's the working. And in the Eden Conspiracy, I do try and show the mathematics, show the logic of how we get to a conclusion that says paleo contact rather than a conclusion that says fiction, fable, moral tale or religion. So for all those reasons, I'm excited about the Eden Conspiracy. I have to sort of sit back and wait and find what people make of it. Does it make sense to the reader in the same way that it makes sense to me? Will people take from it what I think is the central message or will people say there's something else in here that I think is the main thing? And this is where I get into a conversation with my readers, which I always love because it always sends me down new rabbit holes, new investigations. People say, hey, don't you know you missed this out? which corroborates the story, takes us in another direction. I remember after I published um, Escaping from Eden, I heard from so many readers in the Philippines saying, we want to tell you our story. And then I heard from them again when they said, thank you for telling that story in The Scars of Eden. So it's an organic process, really. And I'm in that nail-biting moment of waiting to see the extent to which people pick it up, run with it, share the story and feedback to me. I think that this book, from what I've read so far, is going to do amazing, and it definitely makes sense. It definitely makes sense. And one of the things that I love about the Eden series itself is you sort of go through this this peeling of the onion. You give us the first layer, and then you kind of give us a second layer of it, and now I feel like we're so into the series that we're getting to, like, the 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 little white thing in the middle of the onion. Like, we're getting to the context of what brought it all out, right? And, yeah. and I have to say, you know, I have to say this again, that I credit you as some one of my mentors because you have given me so much information to digest and you've given me so many different ways to look at specific things that I always thought that I knew so profoundly in an, in a much more profound and distinct directional perception that I couldn't have done it without reading some of your books. So, you know, I, I credit you that 100 percent. Your your books have changed my life as, as a researcher and as a person and the way that I look at things and sort of look for that underlining meaning. And I look for that in everything now, not just in, uh-huh. you know, even mundane conversations. I try and peel back that onion. So I have to credit you with that. And we love you here. And I thank you. I appreciate your work. And I'm sure that this one is going to go to the moon like the rest of them. Well, hopefully to the Pleiades. The last one's <laughs> went to the moon. This one will go to the Pleiades. How's that? Oh, thank you, Rob. I really appreciate you saying that. I love the analogy of the onion and peeling back layers of the onion, because I do do that in the Eden Conspiracy. Uh, People who've read Echoes of Eden will start the book and think, oh, we're back in Brazil. Why are we here again? Oh, I know where he's going. And then, oh, no, we've, we've actually gone here. Or people will read and say, ah, he's talking about that dragon's thing again. I know where he's going. And then, oh, oh, no, we've gone here. And each time we go another layer deeper and say, actually, this is the implication of reading some of the Yahweh stories as dragon stories. It has to do with transfers of power that are happening right now in 2023. It has to do with how we understand the work of corporations in our geopolitics how we understand the persistence of old powers after we've had revolutions and replaced kings with prime ministers and kings with presidents, or we've had a general election or a regime change. How is it that the same energy seems to be driving everything? We had a general election here in Australia fairly recently, and the difference from the previous prime minister to the current could hardly be greater in terms of the personality type and the personal aspirations, and yet when we look at the policies, how are we managing the banks? How are we managing corporations? How are we managing those who own power and power generation? How are we managing international relations? How is it so much the same? Where are these policies coming from, if not from the prime minister? Now, all those kinds of questions have answers. And the answers are provided by people who have been around long enough to understand how the world ticks. And those people wrote their narratives in the Bible and other ancestral narratives. We have been provided with 
a political education to help us understand what's going on and why, how to combat uh, unaccountable power or covert government or hidden hands in geopolitics. But all that information evaporates and disappears the moment you lose the paleo contact lens when you read these ancient narratives. So that's that's the deeper layer of the onion we go to in the Eden conspiracy. That's why I feel it's very relevant to 2023. And though, as I say, you could come to this book completely fresh, not having read any of the other Eden books, I think if you've read the first three, there'll be a few moments where you think, oh, I think I've heard this bit before. And then wham, bam, we're in this deeper layer and thinking, all right, now this is something I need to do something about and something we as a society need to understand so we can behave our way to a better future. I, I'm, I'm there with you. And that's one of the things that we've turned this broadcast to is to being able to dictate the terms of our own future and being on that precipice. And I think that the powers that be wouldn't have us privy to this information, but it's people like you who dig, scratch and claw to get it out. And I think it's important that we, we look and sit at your feet, as you sat at the feet of others who came before you, because you're doing the work to really give us something that they don't want us to be privy to. And I think it's important that we do get this information out. And that's why I love when you come on and, and anything I can do to help. I hope you're getting a lot of rest because I know you're going to be doing a ton of interviews over the next few months. That's for sure. With the way that, you know, just in the beginning of this book, the way that it, it captivated me, I know many a reader is going to be captivated in the same way. So I see a big and bright future like you like you've had so far and i see it going even further so paul this is always always a pleasure to have you here i don't want to keep you too long because i know you probably have to get some rest too and things like that And you got a lot going on but we you're always welcome here we love you we appreciate you and I, we just want you to keep going just keep going because people like you give us the ability to dictate those terms of our future definitely i love what you do rob and when you get to the end of the Egan conspiracy uh you and some of our mutual friends uh, make an appearance because I think the kind of conversation we can have in these forums is really important to helping us have a lens on society and having a, a different understanding of ourselves. It requires a great deal of reframing, but also personal encouragement. And I think what you do, Rob, creates um, a pool of community in which we can help each other, compare notes, encourage one another. It's a very, um, it's not just an intellectual shift that has to happen within us. It is an emotional shift, a shift of emotional intelligence, a shift of personal confidence. And we have to have interaction with one another in order to navigate that and to make those shifts. And so I take my hat off to you, Rob, for creating forums like Full Spectrum Universe, because you, this is how we find one another. This is how we find one another and make a positive shift in the way we live together on this planet. I agree wholeheartedly with that. And thank you so much for that. that. That means the world to me. That means that something that I've always envisioned for me and for this broadcast is happening. So I appreciate that, you know, the validation there. I think it's, it's incredible. And, you know, I, I I, I can't say enough. You leave me speechless all the time. When you, but I, I love you, brother. And I, I hope to have you back very shortly once you finish doing the rounds and getting this book out there. And for everybody down in, in the audience who's listening, help promote this book. Paul does an amazing job. Take the links, share them out everywhere. Thank you, John, for the super sticker. Get this book out because it will affect the change that we are looking for. And if not us, then who, right? We are the ones that we've been waiting for. And with this information, we can create the activations around the world that wake people up to this cycle, this repetitive cycle that keeps happening. And we have to kind of shift that mode of thinking and take it from a different angle. And I think Paul does that every time he steps in, into the box and writes one of these amazing books. So with all that being said, thank you, Paul, again. It's an honor and a privilege for you to be here and to have this time to speak with you. I know you're super busy and things you know, are getting crazy for you with the launch of the book. Good luck. I don't think you need it, but good luck because it's important to have each other's back. And if there's anything you need, you can reach out. You know that. And we're here to help in any way, shape or form, me and this whole community. And we 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 appreciate you. 
Oh, thanks, Rob. The feeling is mutual. I really appreciate your personal encouragement, your engagement with the Eden series. And uh, just thank you for being a friend and being the encourager that you have been all the way through this journey. Thank you. Thank you. Of course. Anytime. Anytime. I, I, I respect the hell out of you, brother, for sure. And I, I love the work you do. And I'm always here for you. So with all that being said, uh, this has been an incredible episode. Share this episode out. Like, subscribe. We're on the precipice of something ama amazing and major in this moment. So be the arbiters of what that is. And let's get out there and do the footwork and let's help Paul get this book out. Again, the link is down in the description. Also, you can go to uh, Paul's website as well and follow everything that he does. With we've, we've left everything. We've got the YouTube link. We've got Fifth Kind down there. So you can follow all aspects of what Paul's doing. Paul has an amazing series on uh, Fifth Kind TV as well, which is just it's blossoming into something just so incredible. And, you know, it, it's it's really going to be something great as things, as we move forward with the videos that you do and all the information that you're bringing to bear right now. So with all that being said, thank you all so much for coming by tonight and we'll see you all next time on full spectrum universe.